Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of consulting. I really like giving this presentation because I feel it's another one of those areas that is really prevalent in business today, but tends to not get covered in terms of any formal education. So uh, literally in all the professional jobs I've had in my life, I've had to deal with consultants, either as the consultant myself or on the client side, there's always been a, a consulting relationship at some point with each of my employers. So I don't, I don't know how representative I am, but if I'm representative at all, it's clear that consulting is a prevalent part of life. Uh, in, in, in business life today. And I wanted to go over some tips and uh, put, avoid some potential pitfalls that you can fall into and help explain it a little bit more formally. <clears throat> the, the audience that this is geared towards is twofold. Um, the primary audience is the users of consultants. That is cl potential consulting clients or current consulting clients, uh, helping them understand and deal with some of the relationships there. And also it could be used for uh, the other audience could be current consultants or people considering consulting as a career. It helps uh, give some g generalizations about, uh, about the industry that might help, help people manage their career as a consultant. So with that in mind, let's get started. I've got several things that I want to talk about for this sample. First, I want to talk a little bit about the types of consulting. Second of all, I want to talk about the best practices for selecting a consulting firm and working with a consulting firm. And then I want to talk about some of the potential pitfalls you can fall into. And then I want to talk about just some miscellaneous subjects that I think are important to cover on the topic. And uh, bear in mind as a sample, this is uh, just uh, a, a uh, uh, these are not comprehensive lists. I have more in my live presentations, particularly on the best practices and working with consultants and also on the potential pitfalls. So let's start off with the types of consulting. The first type of consulting that you oftentimes end up with is a subject matter expert. That means that they're not general consultants, they're specific to um, a certain uh, industry, product, tool, or function. So let's talk about first the industry or product. Uh, a good example of this is there are certain people who have design expertise and they become consulting in that area. Uh, I'll use it for example, the, the um, you know, if you look at the airplanes now, they oftentimes have the little shark fins, the winglets on the tips of the uh, tips of the wings there, that's a fuel economy saving. Uh, product and there are some people who are really expertise in that particular product and they consult to the airline developer, the air aircraft manufacturers. Another thing that you, a subject matter uh, that someone could be an expert in is the tool or concept and by tool I don't mean machinery, wrench or hammer, I mean sort of the consulting comment, uh, concept. So for example ISO 9000 certification or Six Sigma or quality circles, I'm using quality is my example here, but they're, they're sort of the expert at applying a certain concept to new businesses and new industries. And uh, we're going to get into, sometimes that can be a little faddish, we'll get into that later, but that's the area that they're subject matter expert in. And the last one is a functional area, a business function like human resources or public relations, or perhaps even like marketing or, or bringing a product to uh, market, new product development. One of the biggest functional areas now in consulting, probably the biggest, is IT. Um, there a lot of the firms out there now are, uh, a lot of the big consulting firms are being bought by, merging with, or buying IT consultancies. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that that might uh, face later. The other, so that's a subject matter expert. The other kind of uh, consultant that you might get into is a more general consulting firm or a management consulting firm. And they're better at sort of looking across the industry and they claim to be generalists and understand how things integrate together in business. But I still think that they tend to skew a little bit towards certain functional areas. I point out operations. Oftentimes they want to talk to you about your uh, manufacturing or supply chain or your, um, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, oh, also like Salesforce productivity or their strategy firms like the big players like McKinsey, Bain, BCG, <clears throat> they, they tend to focus as generalists. I oftentimes think that to some extent they're almost like uh, they have their own set of toolkits or they have their own variety of functional areas within their firm. So even though the firm is general, oftentimes the project, the assignment, the, the, the project that they're working on is actually functional or deals with a specific tool that they might have developed. Another kind of, so this is probably the two biggest ones that people think of when they think consulting, but it's also important to note there's also relationships 
uh, consulting relationships, which is where they might call themselves a consultant, but what, what they really do is they know the people in a certain industry that you're trying to enter, or sometimes this is political. They might know the players in a country that you're trying to expand into, or they might even sort of be a quasi lobbyist. They know how to get uh, re regulation, how to manage your uh, re relationships with the government. And so really when you're paying them, it's not because they know your industry very well or because they're sort of strategy or management consultants. They call themselves consultants, but they're really just facilitators. They're introducing you to the right people. And you have to be a little careful with that because oftentimes this has historically been used uh, if you're doing business overseas as a, uh, an end run around anti-bribery uh, laws. So you'll pay a consultant a large fee and they will then go bribe people on your behalf and you will get the contract and then you can always have the plausible deniability of saying you had no idea that that's what was happening. And that they're cracking down on that. The laws are getting tougher about that, so beware. Um, the last one I wanna talk about is, uh, which is oftentimes called consulting, but I think oftentimes it's, it's exaggerated to call it consulting. It's really more of a contract labor or an outsourcing. This might be where <clears throat> there's a certain some work that you need performed in a certain functional area and rather than hire a full-time person you, You're not sure it's enough for a full-time person or a full-time resource So you or to hire a whole team of people So you just contract it to someone who already does it and the reason I always like to point out the difference between contracting and consulting Consulting being more they're bringing the ideas to you rather than the the uh, labor itself and uh, the reason for that is because it oftentimes uh, has a very different pay scheme. So if you're if you're outsourcing, you're you're or or having contract labor, you're usually doing it to save money. And if you're consulting, uh, it oftentimes charges you a premium for a more short-term assignment. But the thing to bear in mind is you don't want to end up in a situation where you confuse the two and you end up contracting something out and paying more money, but not getting uh, that that incremental idea the the advantage of the ideas. So those are a variety of types of consultants that I talk about. Now let's move on a little bit and talk about some of the best practices. And the first ones deal with uh, when you're deciding to have a consulting engagement. The first thing you want to do is know your purpose. Now that might seem obvious, but I'm going to give you a couple of exceptions to that. The obvious uh, purposes are you want to know what to do. You, if you're hiring them because you're thinking of entering a market, you're hiring them to tell you how big the market will be potentially or what the best entry strategy is. So essentially you're hiring them to answer a question for you. Do some research, do some analysis, and answer a question. Um, but there are some alternatives. Uh, one of them is it might be more general. It might be just for brainstorming. You're looking to bounce some ideas off someone and uh, you need some people with some out-of-the-box thinking from outside the industry. And the, the, another reason that I think is particularly uh, less obvious is oftentimes you're trying to sell your ideas to your board of directors or to other people within the firm and the you hire a consulting firm to almost give you lend credibility to what you want to do and that's uh, those uh, can have some differences in terms of who you hire and what you try and use them for so for example if you're looking to answer a question you might be looking for uh, if you're looking for something narrow, you might want the best product subject matter expert, but if you're looking to sell something to the board of directors, you might want the mar marquee name of the most reputable firm you can hire. Let's uh, move on from knowing your purpose. You also want to know the value proposition, and this gets back to some of the different types of consultants there are. Um, the, for example, the, you don't want to hire someone with uh, a lot of narrow industry product expertise to try and answer a general question because that's better for um, uh, a, general, a generalist firm. And it's also important to note that, you know, the classic question you'll oftentimes get is uh, that these consulting skeptics will say is, what do the consultants know about this industry that I don't know already? And I've always said that's that's if you're if you're really serious about consulting, that's essentially a, a misguided question because they're not being paid necessarily, unless they're a subject matter expert, to tell you something about the industry that you don't know. They're actually they might be trying to bring a toolkit, or they might be bringing some general experience from other industries into your industry, and you want to work with them with the industry experts you have in your company and in your industry to sort of have a symbiotic relationship. And so to ask them, what do you know about the industry or the product is essentially asking the wrong question. That gets particularly 
uh, tricky when you're dealing with young consultants because a lot of the the uh, the workforce in consulting is new graduates and especially sort of the large generalist firms and they always get a lot of pushback from that and I think that's an important thing to train them to respond if they're the consultants and to educate your own uh, workforce who's going to be working with these consultants so that they don't uh, give give the project pushback and inhibit the progress of it. Another thing that you want to bear in mind when you're uh, in best practices choosing your consulting firm, you want to know the scope of the project and research shows that the more narrow the scope, the more specific the question, the better the results generally are when using consulting firms. If you sort of say, hey, what the heck do I do? I don't know what to do. I'm losing money and I have no idea why. There are consulting projects that have worked well for answering that question, but they tend to be, uh, just generally speaking, the research indicates that's a, that's a trickier, a harder thing to do with consultants. Um, it's also, uh, there's a big issue with consulting is what's called scope creep, which means they start out looking at one uh, question and then they get uh, sort of dragged into a conversation on another issue and then dragged into another one. And that can be a problem because nobody really sort of knows the assignment or the, 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 what the accomplishments that they'll be measured on. And this can be a problem inside your firm for two reasons. One of them is oftentimes people who don't want to work with consultants in your firm will deflect them by saying, well, what you really need to be looking at is this guy over there, that gal over there. And all of a sudden they, they get sort of pulled all, all around. Um, you can also run into this issue with firm, the, fir the consulting firm themselves. Sometimes, and we'll get into cyclicality, but if, if times are really good, uh, they might want to really be disciplined about keeping the scope narrow so that they can have uh, uh, the, the they can be gauged most accurately b based on the results they deliver. However, if, if times are a little slower, they might want to uh, allow the scope to creep and allow the project to build so that they can use up some of their underutilized uh, capacity. So the consulting firms can go either way on that, and oftentimes that'll depend on how the industry is going, uh, the consulting industry. You also want to know the type of consultant you're using. We've already talked a little bit about this, but I want to add a couple things to that. One of them is breadth versus depth. Uh, if you're looking for someone to integrate broadly, you don't want to hire a subject matter expert. They might, you know, especially if they're like a professor or something, they might know the narrow, the depth, but not the breadth. And uh, conversely, you don't want to hire. Uh, well, sometimes you can hire a general firm if you want to do something deep. They might have an expert within that firm. Like I said, they sometimes are just a collection of, of functional or project expertise. But you also might want to consider a subject matter expert because it might be easier to deal with a small firm and a single person or a single team. And uh, uh, also might be cheaper because the big firms tend to be expensive. And that gets in a little bit to large versus small. You don't want to use a small firm to do a project that's too big for them to get in over their head. And conversely, you don't want to take a large, you know, you don't want to swat the fly with a sledgehammer, take a large firm to uh, address a small or narrow problem. Uh, so those are some selection criteria. Um, my last point on selection criteria is managers. And I always say, uh, you know, one of the problems that you, this is a, a one of the biggest issues in choosing your firm or who you're going to do your consulting assignment with because oftentimes what happens is the executive gets pitched by uh, at the, at the uh, company, at the client, gets pitched by a partner at the consulting firm and they fall in love, their chemistry is great and then they assign their best managers to work together. And the problem is, I always say, this ends up looking like an arranged marriage because the managers are actually where the work is going to get done and a lot of these decisions are going to get made. And it's actually more important that their chemistry works than if the partners and the, and, and the CEO work. And so I actually think that as you, as you move along, as you, as you get serious about a project, you ask who the managers are going to be and you figure out who your managers are going to be and you make sure those guys meet. And this can be a little bit difficult for self-assured uh, senior executives, but sometimes you might actually sh end up deferring. It's, it's wise to defer to your managers because who they want is more important than who you want. That's a little, uh, it takes a little humility, but it's actually wiser. I always say, I would rather, if I were going to work for a, with a consulting firm, I would rather have the worst partners in the firm and the best managers there than if I had the best partners and the worst managers because uh, the managers are really do the heavy lifting. Partners oftentimes show up for the sales pitch, disappear, and then come back and then get handed the script for the uh, closing meeting. And, and so the managers do the heavy lifting. There's also several people below them, oftentimes associate consultants, consultants, different firms have different words for these things. 
uh, different titles. But my experience is, uh, you know, the managers make the most difference because even if you get sort of a, a group of uh, uh, the B team on your uh, consultants and associate consultants, the managers, if they're good, can keep them in line and, and, and course correct for them. Um, I all, just finally on managers, the partners will always tell you the managers don't matter. We're, they're all good. We have a consistent, they're all the same. And, uh, they, and, and we can choose whoever. If it were my business, I would not accept that. I would want to meet them and I would want to approve of them and, because I think it'll make more, more difference. And you know, yeah, they might be consistently good, um, but not everyone, is as equal as, uh, not everyone is as equal as everyone else, as they say. And also, it might be a cultural fit. You don't want to have a really aggressive shark in a traditional family business because even if they're good at what they do, they might not mesh well. And then the last one I want to talk about, um, which is really sort of a lot of this is selection. This is really the um, hitting the ground running. Uh, you want to talk, I have a lot more on this in the live presentation. That's how do you work with consultants, both as an executive managing a project and as well as being the worker interacting directly with consultant at the working level. Um, you know, it's important to note that oftentimes there are cultural issues with bringing in consultants. Uh, as I say, when you tell your workforce you're going to bring in a consulting firm, very rarely will they say, great, more resources to solve our problem. Oftentimes they greet it with a lot of suspicion and it's only human nature to feel the unknown. And I have some uh, advice on how to assuage that. Um, the best thing you can do is just be candid with your workforce about what this is about and, and try and uh, assuage any concerns that this is about uh, reducing headcount or if it is redu about reducing headcount, be upfront with them about it so that they'll, they'll, they'll not be worried, they'll, they'll know what's coming. So with that in mind, let's talk about some pitfalls that's some uh, working with. Um, here are some traps that you can fall into. Uh, one of them is the failure to consider alternatives to consulting. Um, oftentimes there are consulting, consultants that can solve your problem, but you don't consider would it be easier to do it yourself. Oftentimes there's just a few tools that you could use and you could manage it yourself. And the other possibility is you want to consider uh, maybe if you're regularly having consulting engagements, you should have a strategic hire hire an old consult a, a former consulting manager to manage your own internal consulting staff and I uh, get into a little bit in the live presentation on internal consulting and the advantages and disadvantages of that versus hiring a separate firm um, I think this is a particularly important now that as I mentioned earlier a lot of consulting firms are joining with the IT fields and uh, that can create some uh, significant issues and their incentives are not always well aligned to provide you with cheaper simpler alternatives because if they're affiliated with a tech firm they will offer you a large expensive project that promises to solve all of your problems and it may solve all of your problems but it most certainly will be large and expensive and so there's a lot more risk on the solution than there is on the cost so that's something to bear in mind you want to consider your alternatives also uh, you have to worry about the potential for them taking their ideas. You, you know, you sort of like you train them how to solve a problem for your business or industry, and they immediately, once that concludes, they take it across the street and start doing it for your competitor. In which case, you basically uh, your competitive advantage from this project will be diminished because your competitors will have it as well. And you've taken the money to train the consultants on how to do this, and now somebody else is going to get the benefit of that knowledge. Now, technically speaking, they're not supposed. It's almost always contractually there non-disclosures they can't take your data and and that's true but the generalizations they get like oh this is a good place to look for cost savings in this particular industry that's something that they don't just magically forget uh, I used to work for Bain and Company and when Bain originally started they would they used to to avoid this they'd promise all of their clients we will only work for one company in any given industry and uh, that was uh, pretty successful in fact it was so successful they got one in every industry and they quickly decided that they could double or triple their business by dropping that clause so that didn't last that was sort of a I think it was a good entry strategy into consulting when they were a young less known firm but once they got established that went away um, the next thing I want to talk about is the, the pitfall that uh, consultants oftentimes have perverse incentives to uh, cultivate or uh, elaborate on fads. And there are a couple of ways in which that they are served for doing that. First of all, if everybody's talking about something in an industry, it's an easy sell to the client. Oh, this is the hot new buzzword. We happen to be experts in that buzzword. And they happen, and now all of a sudden they're trying to place articles and promoting it to all of their clients. And it sort of becomes this uh, feedback loop where all of a sudden it gets amplified. It's also important to note that, uh, I had another thought on fads. 
Oh, um, also, if something is new, it's less likely that you will have expertise on it internally. So that makes it a double easily, it, that makes it an even easier sell because they know that they have something that you might not have developed yourself. Implementation. This is the big pitfall. Everybody talks about it. And I have some uh, advice on how to, uh, you know, the classic, uh, I'll, I'll just state it for the record, the classic criticism of consulting is they come in and give great grandiose ideas, but they, you know, then they leave and they never end up being implemented or when they do, they fail to yield the savings. Um, I have a, several pieces of advice on how to avoid that. One of them is you wanna make sure that they don't just show you the benefit of a, cha a change, but also the cost associated with it. I also advise having someone on your team uh, from, from the client side, an, an executive, pretty senior person who can guide them, uh, help them navigate your organization, who knows the corporate culture better because uh, they'll be able to say what they can or can't do and make sure that that person really has a lot of oversight so that uh, they don't get into a political battle over what can or can't be done. And um, one of my favorite things to do on implementation is have gates that show progress. And if the progress is failing to materialize and you have that person on your team who says it's not happening, uh, stop payment. Because uh, if you haven't, you know, I mentioned here the partners can disappear for a while. I guarantee you when you stop paying, magically they will re-engage. And the last one I wanna talk about, this is one of my favorite consulting stories. Uh, I'll just tell you the story, if, uh, it's a, sort of a metaphor. Two men go camping in the woods and they uh, wake up and they find a bear sort of traipsing around their campsite searching for food. And so they both try and sneak out the back of their tent, but one of them stops to put his running shoes on first. And the, the other man says to him, uh, do you think that putting those running shoes is going to help you outrun that bear? And the other man replies, I don't need to outrun the bear. I only need to outrun you. Now, how does this apply to consulting? The answer is oftentimes consultants don't, you know, if you ask them to do the classic market sizing, how big will this market be in five years? They don't have to tell you, uh, they don't have to be right. And in fact, they usually won't. They just have to do as good or better of a job as you could have done on your own. And that's kind of a cynical take. There's not, not really a great piece of advice there. It's just something to bear in mind uh, as you're, as you're uh, listening to their pitches, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then just the miscellaneous things that I wanted to mention, um, a little bit about how the consulting industry works. It's important to note that it tends to be very cyclical. And oftentimes when the economy is good, consulting is at its best and it tends to do poorly when things are s s during economic slowdowns. Now my theory when I went into consulting was, well, in, in slowdowns, don't you need just as much advice to figure out how to adapt to it? And that's an interesting theory. It's not how it works in practice. What tends to happen is when things are great, companies have lots of money to spend on expensive consultants. And as soon as things go down, they're worried about survival and uh, servicing their debt and consulting is the first cost that they can cut. So even oftentimes if they should, they shouldn't, they will end up um, uh, getting rid of their consultants. Um, another thing you wanna bear in mind, consultants, credibility is a big issue with consultants. And so they oftentimes wanna have quick wins when they start on a project, some easy, find the low hanging fruit and demonstrate that they can create value. That's not unimportant, or pardon me, that's not, uh, that's not a bad thing, but it is important to, bear, to, to be aware of that and uh, make sure that quick wins don't distract them from the larger picture. Um, I also have some advice for people considering careers in uh, consulting. They oftentimes sell you on consulting, especially the big firms. If you're graduating from college or business school, they'll, they'll sell you on the idea, well, you know, after this training, you can do anything. And that's technically correct, but I always point out, after being a professional water polo player, you can do anything. The question is not, can you do anything? The question is, how well does it prepare you? And most people who go from consulting firms, uh, there are certain career paths that they tend to follow. And you wanna make sure you're aware of what those are before you go into the field, because <clears throat> for example, if, you, if you're really in love with a small, narrow, sort of niche industry, uh, that they might not be one that values consulting and they won't pay you the salaries, you'll have to take a pay cut and you find that they really don't recognize the value of your experience in consulting. Um, next, n next under my sort of miscellaneous, I talk a little bit about what it's like from the consulting firm's view of engaging the client. I've talked most about from the client's view so I just wanna mention uh, that, that can also be tailored depending on who the audience for my presentation is. And then the uh, the last one I want to make, or I should say second to last, I also talk about some of these models. If you're thinking maybe you should be considering a do-it-yourself alternative, I can present some of the models that the large consulting firms 
uh, look at, especially strategy, uh, because I have some experience in those areas, uh, if that's what the audience asking for my presentation wants to hear. And then finally, um, I can deconstruct some of the sales pitches that you get from these consulting firms to help you make sense of them. Uh, I've always been somewhat amused by the fact that if you ask one consulting firm how they're different than all the others, uh, they will always tell you, well, we're very data driven and we're focused on results, uh, except for the fact that every single one of them will tell you that's how they're different. So uh, I, can, I can get a little bit into that. Um, so that is a little bit on consulting. And if you'd be interested in hearing a presentation like this for your organization or event, please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.